welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm a teacher and author, and this is English Nerd. So I just began a series all about the soliloquies in Shakespeare. I have whole, uh, a whole series about Hamlet going scene by scene. Um, but the first video, if you want to check that out, was just over the to be or not to be speech in Hamlet all by itself. So I wanted to get away from um, Hamlet briefly. I will always return um, to my favorite Shakespeare play. But I wanted to instead talk about Othello um, for today's video. Othello was my favorite tragedy until I started getting more into Hamlet. And my favorite speech in Othello is a soliloquy by the villain Iago. And that is what I'm going to do a deep dive into today. It is the, um, the one where he essentially acknowledges that he is a villain. All right, so here is the beginning of that speech in Othello Act Two, scene three. This is actually Iago's third soliloquy at this point, which is unusual because most of the time the protagonist, as in the, the positive protagonist, um, gets the most speeches. But in Othello, that's not the case. Iago, the villain, gets the most and Othello himself really doesn't get as much um, individual time for us to look into his mind, which is an interesting dynamic. Personally, I really like being able to see uh, Iago and what he's thinking. He's so devious and so evil, and this is just the best example of that, I think. It goes a little bit onto the next page, so I'll um, switch over when we get there, of course. So it starts off this way. As soon as Cassio leaves, just for a little bit of context, um, Cassio is the person who got promoted above Iago as the General Othello's second in command. Iago thinks that he deserves that spot, um, but Cassio got it instead. So in order to discredit Cassio, Iago intentionally got Cassio drunk and um, kind of incited other uh, somebody else to attack Cassio and so there was this big brawl and it made him look bad in front of um, Othello and so Iago suggests that Cassio goes to uh, um, Othello's new wife and who's a friend of Cassio's to beg for the position back in Othello's good graces and Iago is going to use all of this to his advantage to make it look like Cassio is having an affair with Desdemona, Othello's wife, and in that way he's going to take down Cassio, he's going to take down Desdemona, he's going to take down eventually Othello. That is his, his evil plan. So he's just given Cassio the advice to go try to repair his reputation through begging for um, Desdemona to help him. So as soon as Cassio leaves, Iago says, and what's he then that says, I play the villain? When this advice is free, I give and honest, probable the thinking and indeed the course to win the more again. Okay, so what I love right out of the bat, uh, right off the bat here is that he turns essentially to the audience. He's been manipulating everybody else up to this point. He's been manipulating Othello and Cassio and Desdemona and the people around him. Um, but here he says, what's he then that says, I play the villain? He's, he's the person who is aware almost that this is a play, which is such a cool, unusual dynamic in Shakespeare. It's, he's breaking the fourth wall, basically, and saying, you think I'm the villain of this story? What have I done wrong? And then you think back and they're actually, apart from his, his scheming, um, he's mostly given decent advice. He just knows how everybody's going to take it and how he can twist it to his own ends. So he's not only manipulating the characters, but the audience as well. And it's hard not to get sucked into his, his intelligent magnetism, even as you know he's a terrible person. So what's he then that says, I play the villain when this advice I give is free and honest? So these little notes, by the way, that are already here are from my, this is my college edition of the book. So the reason that I have honest um, boxed out there is that Iago throughout the story is called Honest Iago, and it just becomes more and more horribly ironic with a lot of dramatic irony The, um, the when the audience knows something that the characters don't. I mean, that, that sense just gets more and more acute as time goes on. So he says, I'm giving all this honest advice, and it's like, is it is it really honest? 
Um, Probable to thinking and indeed the course to win the Morgan. He's not he's not wrong. That is a decent way to get back in the good graces of Othello if Cassio can um, appeal to Desdemona, his wife. So so again, he's defending himself here, but he, it's about to take a turn. He does know that he is the villain of this story. For tis most easy, he continues, the inclining Desdemona to subdue in any honest suit. So again, we get the word honest here. He's repeated it twice. But we also have some other interesting word choice, such as the inclining Desdemona to subdue. And so you see the, these little subtle hints that he is trying to subdue his victims in the way that he's giving this this um, advice. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. Now, this is kind of a difficult line here. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. Now, if you look at the footnotes, um, so she is framed as fruitful, made as generous as the free elements, as basic nature. I feel like that's an incomplete way of, of uh, explaining what Iago is saying here. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. So she's as generous as, as anything, but fruitful, th there are all these references throughout the play to her, um, well, to her sexuality in different ways. And so you have fruitfulness associated with Desdemona, not only as a sense of, of generosity, um, but also I think there's a nod to how, um, you know, fertile she is or, or something like that. And you'll see, you'll see later in this speech um, as well, some evidence for that. The entire play, I think, backs that up. And then for her to win the more, the more is Othello. Were it to renounce his baptism, all seals and symbols of redeeming sin, his soul is so unfettered to her love that she may make, unmake, do what she list, even as her appetite shall play the god with his weak function. So we have a complicated sentence here. And as with all Shakespeare, it's a good idea to read straight through the lines uh, when there's no punctuation, because it is meant to be read as sentences, not just as, well, you pause there. The reason that we have these, these line breaks at all is for there to be a, a certain beat, a certain meter that remains consistent throughout, which actually aids in memorizing, but that's just an aside. So, and then for her to win the more, um, so he's saying, uh, his soul is so infettered, that's, that's like shackled to her love that she may make, unmake, do what she list, what she wants, uh, even as her appetite, her passions, uh, her desires shall play the god with his weak function. So Desdemona is portrayed as the power in this relationship, even though stereotypically, certainly at this time, the man, especially a general, would have the power. Now, it's important to note, um, I'm not going to get deeply into it here, but it does, it does um, definitely feature. Iago is quite aware of the, uh, of race here. Othello is famously Shakespeare's black protagonist, and he has many noble features and things that were not normally granted to a black character in the English Renaissance. Um, but everybody is super aware of that whole racial component. Desdemona is white. Um, Othello is black. So when it talks, when he calls him the more, just calling him the more kind of calls out that racial element because a more is um, somebody who is uh, historically at least a Muslim from Northern Africa. So he's saying, okay, she has all this power over him. Um, so even if he were, even if he had to renounce his baptism, so he's he's been baptized into the Christian faith kind of as a, a way it seems to fit into this Italian world that he's living in that is mostly European. All seals and symbols of redeemed sin. His soul is so infettered to her love that she may make, unmake, do what she list. So he, she has the power here. Um, so you can, you can kind of peel back the layers there of Iago's, um, honestly, 
racism and and sexism here uh which is which just makes him somebody that you want to despise but on the other hand his plan is so brilliant that it's like you're looking at this train wreck and you know you ought to look away but you you can't you want to see how it all turns out so her appetite shall play the god with his weak function so he's assuming that Othello because of his attachment to Desdemona is weaker than she is she has absolute power over him um, and so Iago is planning to use that to take Othello down. How am I then a villain? So he returns to this idea that he claimed at the beginning that, you know, who's saying that I play the villain? I don't think so. Look, look how honest I'm being. He returns to this. How am I then a villain to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directly to his good? Again, remember, Cassio is Desdemona's friend, and so... Um, that's, that's kind of how he's, how uh, uh, Iago's playing this. I'm, I'm sending him on this good course. I'm, I know, I know these people and I'm giving them advice that makes sense. But then he immediately switches and says, divinity of hell. When devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now. Whew, that is some chilling juxtaposition there. This is really the crux of he's of showing that he is self-aware. Two times he claims, I'm not the villain. Who's saying this? Who Who is out there in the audience watching and thinking that I'm the bad guy when really I'm just giving some decent advice. It's Othello's fault if he, if he is beholden to his wife. So he's saying all of these things, right? But then when he switches here, um, the juxtaposition is just so, so amazing. When devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now. So a few things to note about this set of lines here, besides the general impressiveness. He is aware that he is this devil. And that is actually one way of reading Othello in general, thinking that Iago is evil incarnate because... He knows that he is a devil. Um, he is essentially seducing all of the characters toward their demise, toward um, sin or destruction or whatever it, whatever it may be that will take them down um, for reasons that are not entirely clear. I mentioned that Cassio got promoted above Iago, and that is the strongest argument for why he is doing this, but it's too weak for the level of revenge that... Iago gives, and Iago throws out a few different potential reasons for why he would want the de everyone destroyed, but it feels like he's making excuses for the audience. Like, does this work for you? Does this work for you? And really all he wants is just destruction. So he is this devil character who is appearing in a way that seems good um, in order to tempt everybody to their demise. There's also this play throughout the throughout the play, of the idea that it's Iago, the, the white European character who has the blackest sins. Really, it's the inside of a person rather than, you know, the external skin color that's going to, um, you know, determine the kind of person that they are. So he's, he's playing on this. Yes, he is um, very negatively focused on, on race, and he says um, some some pretty horrific things throughout the play um but just just be aware that there is this there is this interplay of black and white dark and light that has so a depth of meaning in this particular um tragedy for whiles this honest fool referring to cassio plies desdemona to repair his fortune and she for him pleads strongly to the more othello so he's just recapping his plan here he's gonna have Cassio ply Desdemona you know request beg Desdemona to repair his fortune get him back in good standing with Othello I'll pour this pestilence into his ear that she repeals him for her body's lust so this is the crux of Othello's plan he is going to manufacture it so that it looks like Desdemona and Cassio are having an affair with one another and he's going to do this by making Cassio meet with Desdemona alone 
and he's he's just going to capitalize on on that. I think it's interesting that he says, "I'll pour this pestilence into his ear." It's it's very reminiscent of the way that Hamlet Senior, King Hamlet, is killed at the beginning uh, or before the beginning of Hamlet, the play. The idea of poison, poison in the ear. It's a pretty common uh, image in Shakespeare, in fact, because of the idea that. Although in Hamlet, it's a literal poison being poured into a literal ear of the king. Here, this is referring to the poisonous words of Iago. And it's that idea, the idea that words can be poison, words can be healing, words have this kind of magical power. Um, before this, in the play, Othello is talking about how he how he wooed Desdemona, who was um, somebody that that was not uh, a clear match for Othello, largely because of the of the racial difference, and and Desdemona and Othello both describe how it was the just the the magically amazing quality of Othello's stories and his words that allowed her to fall in love with him and and really began their relationship. So this is the other side of that coin. It's not this positive magical quality of words. It is the harmful, poisonous side of words. So he's so Iago is going to pour this pestilence into Othello's ear that she repeals him for her body's lust. So I know I'm, I'm going a bit uh, into the context and historical things and, and all of that, but that's just how I think, so it's what I'm going to share. <laughs> um, so Desdemona, for context, is not somebody who comes across as a woman who would just drop everything and have this affair. She comes across as somebody who's incredibly loyal, incredibly faithful, and yet at the time there was this assumption that women um, in general had uh, had loose morals unless they were controlled by some, by a man, essentially. And so... Shakespeare in this play it's interesting because he he defies racial and gender stereotypes by showing that Desdemona is incredibly faithful that Othello is a nobler character than most of his white counterparts um but he also is a product of his time and so you have these these references that really can rub a modern audience the wrong way so just it, I'm not going to say that Shakespeare is above such things always, um, but he but he did do more to break out of that mold than the majority of his um, contemporaries. Okay, do continue. And by how much she strives to do him good, by by reconciling the two, Cassio and, and Othello, she shall undo her credit with the more. So I will turn her virtue into pitch. So. This is this is interesting. Okay, let's let's finish it and then I'll talk about it. So, will I turn her virtue into pitch and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all? Dun, dun, dun. And then Rodrigo comes in this other character. So that's where the soliloquy stops, um, right here. So I shall turn turn her virtue into pitch. So Iago is aware that Desdemona would not run off with Cassio. Um, he's aware that she's a virtuous character. And he's going to use that very goodness to take her down. Um, and it turns out he's going to use Othello's um, jealousy, some of his insecurities about winning this, this amazing woman to fall in love with him um, against him as well. So just the, the depth of how, how much Iago understands the psychology of all of this is um, part of what makes him so fascinating. So he knows that she's good and virtuous. He knows how she's going to respond to Cassio's pleas for assistance. She's going to help. She's generous. She's kind. She's loyal to um, to her friends, to her husband. So he's going to turn her virtue into pitch. Pitch is uh, like tar, right? It's black and sticky. So again, we have this sense of, um, I'm going to turn something that is, that is light, that is pure, that is... Um, good into something dark, um, which is, again, referencing it more of in a, in a moral dimension. Back down here, he said, the blackest sins, and he's going to make her goodness look like these, these dark sins. 
um, and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. This idea of a net or um, just a web, something woven to catch them, runs throughout this entire play. You see it with the um, the famous handkerchief, assuming that you have uh, some knowledge of, of this play, the famous strawberry handkerchief. Um, he mentions a web in Cyprus when they first arrive, and Cassio and Desmona are talking to each other. So this is, again, a, a motif, uh, an idea that comes up again and again as a way to weave all of these strands with with Iago as the kind of spider in the center pulling all of these these different strands <laughs> and um, bringing everybody to their to their doom so that is that is it that's the uh, what's he that says I play the villain speech by Iago in Shakespeare's Othello so I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into Iago's soliloquy from Shakespeare's Othello. It is one of my favorite speeches that he wrote, um, certainly one of my favorite soliloquies from any of his plays. So um, hopefully you got something out of that. As always, if you're writing a paper or something like that, do your own investigation. Don't just take my ideas. That is what we call cheating, everybody. And, and uh, too often people don't talk about what cheating actually is. So just um, do take these ideas, but take them and build on them, and uh, hopefully your, your appreciation for this speech has grown. So don't forget to subscribe to English Nerd for more English nerdy goodness. Like this video if you like it, and let me know if you have any questions or comments down below, and I'll see you next time.